Hello everyone, I'm Claudia Czerwińska. Welcome to World News Tonight here on TVP World. Tonight we will be taking a closer look at the recent protests in Poland over abortion and how American elections are affecting transatlantic relations in our region. Later I will be joined by our guest, the Polish opposition member of the parliament, Marcin Przydacz, former deputy minister of foreign affairs. But before that happens, let's take a look at the latest headlines. What are the reasons behind the recent protests over abortion in Poland? Finland's new deportation bill, aiming to curb migration influx from Russia, is now in force. In a historic turn, the unemployment rate in Poland has fallen below 5%. Hundreds gathered outside of the Polish parliament tonight to protest the recent failed vote on easing abortion restrictions. Our reporter, Kazimierz Wysiak, was there at the protest and has this next report. We're standing here in front of the Polish Parliament building in Warsaw, and behind me you can see there are dozens and dozens of people, at least a hundred, gathered here to protest against the recent failed vote on the easing of abortion law in Poland. Currently, Poland has some of the most restrictive rules on abortion in all of Europe, and the people gathered here are extremely dissatisfied with the new ruling coalition, a center liberal coalition, which promised them to ease the restrictions on abortion. But as we know, this has failed. It's extremely difficult. Uh, we've been in the streets of Poland for eight years. Can we imagine they? that? Eight years of fighting, of protesting, of uh, being uh, shouted at, being uh, tried to shut up. And after eight years, when we thought we might possibly retire, we need to start fighting again. Now, some of the politicians of the new ruling coalition say that perhaps uh, this issue should be resolved with a referendum, a national referendum on the matter of abortion. We have the stance of one side, but we also need to listen to the other side. That's why we propose the referendum. Let's talk and give the voice to the citizens. Whether this will come to be, whether there will be a referendum on the topic of abortion is still a topic of debates in the Polish parliament. It's still not clear. However, what the politicians of the ruling coalition are saying is they now need to come back to a drawing board and decide what to do next on this very divisive issue. From Warsaw, TVP well, Kazimierz Wysiak. What is the reason behind the recent protest in Poland over abortion? Take a look at our explainer about the vote in Parliament which failed to loosen restrictions on abortion access, what led to it and what's next. Immediately after the new ruling coalition came to power in Poland, it was clear that some issues would be more divisive than others. In the beginning of July, these predictions came true, as the parliament rejected the easing of restrictions on abortion by a margin of three votes. Women's rights activists were furious. It's very disappointing because uh, the win for this coalition that is ruling now was brought by women and young people, the people who protest and people who totally support human rights, women's rights, legal abortion. The proposed changes concerned the removal of criminalization for doctors who performed abortions up to the 12th week of pregnancy. The previous conservative government of the Law and Justice Party made this act punishable by up to three years in prison. This caused massive protests on the streets of Warsaw. I came here because I do not agree with women dying, that they have no choice, that doctors have some conscience clause. If they want conscience clauses, they should change their profession. In the new ruling coalition, it was the agrarian Polish People's Party which voted against the easing of restrictions, and they refused to budge on that issue. We have our own draft of an abortion bill and we want to see it adopted. Look at the numbers, only 8.5 million people out of the 21 who voted gave their support to parties which wanted to make abortion illegal up to the 12th week of pregnancy. But other statistics, like the poll conducted by United Service, an IBRIS project, say the majority of polls would like to see abortion decriminalized. Currently, Poland has some of the toughest restrictions on abortion in all of Europe. 
Speaking with TVP World's reporter Karolina Stoltzman, Warsaw Mayor Rafał Trzaskowski said that his hopes for resolving the scandal involving the misuse of the Pegasus spyware by Poland's previous administration remain high. Now that the Cor European Court of Human Rights is taking a closer look at the case, he also explained why is it crucial to prevent such incidents from happening in the future. The committee is still working and there's a possibility that we will soon learn whether the Pegasus platform was actually deployed against politicians of the then opposition. Some disturbing facts have already been revealed, but it's essential for preserving democracy that scandals like these are brought to light and the persons involved brought to account so that situations like these don't happen again. No administration should have the power or the will to use spyware systems to surveil the opposition, especially in the course of electoral campaigns because that violates the principles of fair elections. Let's hope that the court proceedings currently underway bring us closer to the truth. After last week's first plenary of the new European Parliament concluded in Strasbourg, political groups have chosen who will chair the various committees and subcommittees. Considered the lifeblood of parliamentary work, committees are vital for preparing legislative amendments to the Commission and charting the course of plenary sessions. One of the most influential committees is now in the hands of the Polish MEP from the center-right EPP. Sasha Farbach, our Brussels correspondent, has this report. From foreign affairs to regional development and industry, today the battle for who would chair and lead the 20 committees and four subcommittees in Parliament has concluded. As the dust settled, the center-right EPP and other main groups, including the Socialists, walked away with key posts. Polish MEPs snatched two chair positions, including the powerful Industry, Research and Energy Committee, which will now be headed by Boris Budka from the EPP. Overall, Polish MEPs now have two chairmanships and five vice chairs, putting them in third position behind German and Spanish MEPs. As the main political group celebrated the issue of the political cordon sanitaire, Brussels speak for keeping the far right out of any positions of influence has again resurfaced. In Strasbourg last week, none of the parliament's new vice chair or quester positions went to the far right groups. After last week's vote, the far right slammed their exclusion, saying the political firewall is undemocratic. The center right EPP group and their allies, however, didn't see the problem. Listen, it's democratic decision, all democratic parties also. It's every time democratic. And it's so if someone really blame democratic values, blame democratic Europe, is if sometimes as Minister of Foreign Affairs of Hungary goes to Russia and speak that uh, European Union wants war, against the Russia. The, the candidates have been able to, to run, they were elected, they are here in parliament and uh, are doing their jobs, but proportional representation means also that alliances and majorities in democracy are the ones who set the trend. Uh, I am happy that we are still having a pro-European majority and the alliance that was created is a pro-European one. The newly formed Orban-friendly Patriots for Europe and the AfD-led sovereigntists, widely considered anti-EU, have reacted with outrage. This is a result of fear. It's a coalition of fear, what you have with von der Leyen. Von der Leyen uh, using a, a conservative vote she got eh, for embracing all the left, the extreme left, the far, far extreme left. They would have us inside and they, would, they, they, they can't bear it because they know that our message is the message which is growing in Europe, the national, the national message. Their message is the message of the past, and they have failed. Due to the European Parliament system of proportionality, the Patriots group with 84 MEPs banked on the fact that some positions would be assigned to them. However, with today's committee results and last week's block by the centre, it does appear that the Accord and Sanitaire is in effect. It seems that despite gains in the European parliamentary elections in June by the far right, Brussels is holding firm to parties that are towing the pro-EU line. Yet one noteworthy development, despite being behind the cordon in past years, the appointment of a Polish ECR MEP as committee chair implies that not all firewalls last forever. 84, abstentions 15. 
Now that Joe Biden has announced he would not seek re-election, it is time to look at his legacy as the 46th president of the United States. Political commentators believe that while his track record is impressive, his political legacy will not be remembered so fondly. Let's take a look at the past four years of the Biden's administration. This is America's day. This is democracy's day. A day of history and hope of renewal and resolve. Joe Biden took over the helm in Washington at the height of the COVID pandemic. He oversaw a smooth distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine and forced through a series of relief packages. Consequently, the economy bounced back faster in the U.S. than in other developed countries. It's essential we provide immediate relief for working families and businesses now. The Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 caused food and gas prices to soar all over the world. Biden's Inflation Reduction Act had little impact on curbing inflation rates, but had an overwhelmingly positive impact on other aspects of the U.S. economy. But here at home, inflation is coming down. Here at home, gas prices are down $1.50 from their peak. Food inflation is coming down. Not fast enough, but coming down. Inflation has fallen every month for the last six months while take-home pay has gone up. A near record. Biden also did a lot to reindustrialize and bring manufacturing back to the U.S. This shift in the American economic model is still underway, but has already improved the living standards of many local communities. Biden's political legacy is much trickier. Although it was Trump's decision, Biden administration oversaw the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan. He is also associated with failing to contain the border crisis and growing illegal immigration rates. The failure to codify the right to abortion into law will also remain a key Biden-era grievance for the Democrat base. Abortion is our right! We won't give up our fight! Biden's strong support for Israel's war in Gaza also drew a lot of criticism from Democrat voters. One group um, is saying, frankly, it doesn't matter what you do from here on in. What you have done is, in my mind, disqualifying. In Europe, Biden will be remembered as a close wartime ally to Ukraine and a president who restored cordial relations between Washington and the EU. We have an enormous opportunity. Kamala Harris might not have clinched the Democrat nomination yet, but it's becoming increasingly likely that she will be facing Donald Trump in the November elections. Our reporter Marek Steele polled the people of Warsaw on how they perceive the prospective Democrat nominee. Trump would not really be a good president for, for us. Like He's not really keen on helping this part of Europe, so I think um, Kamala Harris would be the better choice. Personally, I would prefer Kamala Harris to be the president. I think she shares Joe Biden's view on foreign policy. It's a good thing. I think Kamala Harris will do well. She's keeping the same campaign staff and it should all go fine. Finland's new deportation bill aiming to curb migrant influx from Russia has come into force. But human rights groups are saying that Helsinki has now effectively legalized pushbacks banned by international law. Marek Steele has the details. The EU's external border, a target for hybrid attacks by Russia and Belarus. Russia is luring migrants from Yemen up north exploiting the misery and pushing them deliberately against the Finnish border. We should always keep in mind a member state's border is a European border. And we will do everything we can to make them stronger. Finland has taken some firm measures to tackle this crisis. Not only are all border crossings between Finland and Russia closed, Helsinki has now permitted Finnish border guards to turn away asylum seekers at Finland's eastern border. It's very sensitive. We, we shouldn't exceed uh, powers I mean, given to our border guards. But again, we have to protect from uh, uh, authoritarian regimes attempts to infiltrate and probably to increase domestic tensions within our countries by, you know, uh, bringing uh, illegal migration over the border. The bill that came into force this Monday was passed by the Finnish parliament with an overwhelming majority. Human rights watchdogs say that the law has essentially legalized pushbacks. 
I hope this law will never need to be used, but we are prepared and we did it here today, together. It is a strong message to Russia, it is a strong message to our allies. Finland takes care of its own security, we ensure the security of the EU border. No one really is contesting that by passing this law, Finnish government is violating at least some legal obligations. And then the argument has been that national security has to be ranked higher. A few years back, similar measures were taken by Poland, Lithuania and Latvia. Then Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko orchestrated a border crisis. Migrants were lured into Minsk and promised a fast and easy path to the European Union. What they found was barbed wire and helplessness. Migration is used like a hybrid tool. It's uh, it's something uh, which still must be understood in uh, in the European quarters much better. Tough measures introduced at the EU's external borders are bringing effects. Illegal crossings have dropped by half since Poland introduced a buffer zone on its border with Belarus. Ukraine's top diplomat Mitro Kuleba is visiting China for talks on how to end Russia's war in Ukraine. Beijing has tried to position itself as a mediator in the conflict, while at the same time helping keep Russia's war economy afloat through trade. Kyiv has maintained diplomatic relations with China throughout Russia's war in Ukraine, despite the trade support Beijing offers Moscow. Now Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, is in Beijing to discuss a possible Chinese role in bringing an end to the war. China will continue to stand on the side of peace and dialogue and support the international community in gathering more consensus, as well as jointly looking for practical ways to find a political resolution to the crisis. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has said that only the world's most powerful countries can successfully help resolve the conflict. With the prospect of Donald Trump retaking the White House in November, potentially throttling U.S. military aid to Ukraine, Kyiv is exploring the role Beijing might play in bringing about peace. Russia's accelerated prosecution and jailing of two Western journalists is fueling speculation that Moscow may be planning a prisoner swap with the U.S. and Germany. It comes after Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich was on Friday in prison for 16 years on spying charges, while also a journalist Al Sukurmasheva was sentenced to more than six years behind bars. Russian-American radio journalist Alsu Kurmashev is held in the cage of a Russian court. It emerged on Monday that she had been imprisoned last week for six and a half years. Her crime spreading false information about the Russian army. Also jailed last Friday was U.S. reporter Evan Gershkovich, 16 years in a penal colony after being convicted of espionage. His case was unexpectedly brought forward and rushed through trial. It's thought they'll be used as pawns by President Vladimir Putin in a prisoner swap. Russian civil society in diaspora is outraged. If you take those people who are active and following the events, they understand uh, the game of Mr. Putin. They know that they are hostages and they are there to be exchanged. Commentators believe the exchange would likely be for a hitman, Vadim Krasikov, who's in a German jail for murdering an exiled Chechen Georgian dissident five years ago. The trial judge said the kill order must have come from the Russian president. It's believed Putin is fighting for Krasikov's return to demonstrate his loyalty to his inner circle. He needs to show to his cronies that he is the pivotal element of the entire system. That's why he will fight for Mr. Krasikov. Putin has said he's open to the idea of a trade involving Gershkovich and that contacts have already taken place with the United States. After the sham trials of the past few days, Western leaders will be weighing up the price of any prisoner swap with Russia. According to the latest data, Poland's economy remains strong. For the first time since the country's post-communist transition, the registered unemployment rate has hit a record low, falling to 4.9 percent in June. For the first time since statisticians began compiling unemployment data, the official figure in Poland has fallen below 5 percent. 
published by Statistics Poland, the numbers highlight a large decrease in the number of economically active citizens by about 200,000 people over the past year. One of the lowest unemployment levels in, in the European Union. Uh, and it's a, a huge achievement. I mean, 20 years ago, we had an unemployment of over 20%. This, in turn, has made it easier for those entering the market, or the unemployed, to find a job. However, this might not be good news for employers. It's a huge achievement on the one hand, but for the employers, for the firms, it starts to be a headache at the same time, because uh, uh, for the people it's easy to find a, a job, but for the employers it's not easy to find a, a worker. The report also highlights the difficult situation for unemployed Poles aged 45 or over. Usually, the duration of their job search is longer than that of young people. Currently, Poland's unemployment rate is the second lowest in the EU, with the first place belonging to the Czech Republic. Looking at the international situation, it is impossible to overlook the events of days past in the United States, which is getting closer to the presidential elections. America seems increasingly preoccupied with its own problems. I am now joined by our guest, Polish opposition member of parliament Marcin Przydać, former Polish deputy minister of foreign affairs. And we're going to talk about how the American elections affect transatlantic relations and our region. Thank you so much for joining me tonight here on TVP World. Very good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure as always. So let's start on a high note. How do you assess the change of the of the candidate in the Democratic Party? Well, uh, it seems it's kind of a restart of the political campaign for Democrats. Uh, um, as we all know, uh, Joe Biden decided to quit, uh, decided to resign somehow. Uh, he is still the president of the United States, but he is not going to run for the next uh, um, term. So uh, there won't be, I think, that many changes uh, um, in case Kamala Harris is the next president. Although, as for now, uh, I would assess that it's 90% uh, chances for Kamala Harris to be the next candidate. Who will be the next president, we'll see uh, in the late um, autumn. Uh, it seems that uh, the probability of the, of the victory of Donald Trump is still very, very um, high because he is very much warmed up uh, in, uh, um, in his campaign. But as I said, the reset or restart of this campaign may give a, uh, a bit of uh, more chances for, for the new candidate uh, for Democrats. So we'll see. You mentioned that there might not be such a big difference, such a big gap between uh, Vice President Kamala Harris and current President Joe Biden. However, some experts are pinpointing certain uh, differences. Um, considering what we've seen and heard so far, what do you think, if you could pinpoint these, what would be some of the differences between the two in terms of foreign policy? Well, you know, Joe Biden was an expert on foreign policy. He was very much active um, since the 80s or in the 90s. He was one of those who was a very uh, big supported of uh, um, NATO enlargement, for example. So very much experience in foreign policy. He understood very much uh, and very well the challenges uh, posted by um, Russia, but also um, China. Kamala Harris is not that expert. She's not a foreign. Um, he, he was, she, she was not a diplomat. She was not an expert in foreign policy. So maybe she was uh, more of a law enforcement she person. She was a rather prosecutor, right? right, right uh, lawyer. So probably uh, her um, activities will, would be very much based on the uh, expertise of uh, of her experts and uh, collaborators. Um, uh, what would be the difference? Uh, uh, her understanding of Europe and especially the ch challenges in Eastern and Central Europe could be uh, a bit different uh, comparing to Joe Biden. But as we all uh, know, uh, the, the entire Democratic uh, uh, party of, of, of the United States, they are very much in favor of continuation of policy, of, of uh, uh, kind of uh, deterrence policy towards, mm -hmm. uh, towards Russia. Although the Chinese factor could be also very much um, important. And the domestic um, challenges uh, um, could dominate um, her presidency. But uh, if I could get any, I mean, give any bets, uh, I'm not that sure that it would be the Democratic um, president who, who's going to win the, uh, the next election. I still believe, uh, um, although it's not my job, I mean, to, to predict, or it's not my job, maybe it's, it is my job to predict, but it's, uh, I'm not the voter, I'm not the American voter. Uh, I, I would take any, any president of the United States as a good partner to, to discuss, but if I could um, predict, I think Donald Trump has still uh, much bigger chances to uh, to win, but there are still mm, few months. We have until the, November. Campaign, yes. We have to remember that we have until November to to figure out what's going to happen. Which takes me to my next question, which is: We now know that VP 
Harris actually has a chance of, of getting the number of votes to be eligible. The choice still has to be made. Um, is this a new chapter in the presidential race? Do you think that um, the fact that Kamala Harris is trying to get that nomination would give a renewed strength to the Democratic Party th until the convention on the 19th of August? That, that is what we started our conversation on. Uh, I said it's a restart, the reset of the, of the campaign. So, of course, uh, uh, for her, there would be a, a, a lot of energy. Uh, we, we've seen it already. We've noticed that with uh, uh, Democratic supporters, right, financing uh, the new uh, campaign. So they really wanted kind of new spirit in this uh, um, campaign. So this change may give her uh, more opportunities. Although uh, she was also very much um, um, or harshly criticized uh, during the last term as a VP. Uh, she has not omitted, you know, mistakes. Uh, she, she made a lot of uh, um, difficult, um, I would say, decisions, uh, harshly criticized for, for this. So we will see what the American voters uh, um, decide about about this um, candidate in the in the future. Uh, Trump, uh, Donald Trump, uh, in those all those uh, swing states is still um, uh, kind of number one uh, in many, uh, starting from is there Arizona, that Wisconsin. But do? Uh, well, she to, needs to, to present turn a, new, that swing vote around? A, a new energy. So uh, we'll see. I think that uh, the Democratic Party will also play on the, on her gender, on the fact that she's a woman. The first, probably, prob you know, not the first candidate, but uh, uh, but probably uh, she would be presented as a, as a new kind of strength, a new. Um, a, a new candidate when it comes mm -hmm. to, to the fact that she's a, um, a woman. She's also from the um, minorities, I mean, a representative of the minorities, so probably they, so they're going to they're gonna collect some voters uh, uh, of the uh, minorities uh, uh, in, the, in the United States. So um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see indeed. Um, obviously, we are looking at the situation somewhat from behind a glass across the pond. But the question is, as we're here today, we are in the European Union. What's in it for us? So considering the Polish perspective and the continental security with the ongoing war in Ukraine, um, if you were to assess both of the one potential nominee and the other nominee from both sides, um, which one would be better for Poland? As I said at the very beginning, I mean, it's not up to us, it's not up to polls uh, to um, decide about the future president of the United States. It's up to the American voters. So uh, we will uh, take any decision. Yeah, the beauty of democracy, but we'll take any decision for our government, but also, I mean, for us as the opposition, our job is to um, get the best possible context to uh, every possible um, president of the, of, the, of the US with both uh, uh, us as a conservative party, we do have with both very good context. Uh, uh, let me just uh, recall the fact that uh, uh, during the term of President Andrzej Duda, uh, every single president of the United States paid a visit to, uh, to Warsaw. It was uh, uh, Obama, but uh, Trump also many times, and, and Joe, um, uh, Joe Biden. So for us, it's quite natural to have good uh, relations with, uh, with any possible um, uh, uh, president of the U.S. Uh, when it comes to our government, I think they still have a lot to do, a, a job to do, because they are very much openly, openly cheering for uh, the Democratic candidate. It won't be easy for them uh, to establish good contacts with, uh, uh, with Trump and, uh, and uh, his I mean, possible administration. We have to bear in mind, especially you know, looking at the events of day past, we had uh, the meeting of foreign ministers in Brussels taking place over, over two days. We had the Blenheim Palace, the European political community taking place yeah. in Oxford share. We hear different and we also hear from representatives of the current government that there is a push to work with whichever uh, whichever uh, uh, president cannot, is going to take office. But we cannot forget the words which uh, were outspoken by many representatives of, of uh, Civic Platform or this left, uh, le uh, liberal left coalition in Poland criticizing harshly uh, Mr. Mr. Trump and the fact that uh, uh, candidate to be a um, ambassador or without the signature of the president, but the, the head of the Polish um, embassy in, in Washington is Bogdan Klich, who um, in a you know, couple of months ago uh, openly criticized Trump uh, um, for his uh, uh, you know, activities and his, his words. So I presume that it won't be very easy for, uh, for the Polish government uh, 
uh, to establish good contacts since Mr. Trump is quite sensitive, as we all know, about his uh, comments on, on, his, on him, himself, and the, and, the, and the decision he's taken. I think when, when, higher, when higher stakes are at play, there is there's definitely a space for so. consensus. But since, so. since we're speaking Because on it is in our interest, absolutely, it is in Polish interest to have the best possible contacts with, uh, with American That's administration. That's without doubt. That's yeah. without doubt. But since we're talking about words, let's have some, uh, let's hear some actual words from uh, Poland's Radosław Sikorski. Uh, the foreign minister who spoke with uh, Politico mm -hmm. and in his interview he made a statement about the extent to which Europe should rely on itself. So let me quote this. European countries have no other choice than to take on more responsibility for their collective defense given that Washington will continue to keep, I quote, close eye on Asia. It is our job to explain to our U.S. partners that as long as we are feeling Russia's threat we won't be able to engage fully there. What do you think? What should Europe do in this relationship with the U.S., forming the future relationship with the U.S., and in terms of being more self-sufficient? Well, there are some differences in our uh, position when it comes to the future of transatlantic relations. I mean, the, uh, the conservative opposition is very much in favor of uh, bringing more American presence uh, on the European continent. Uh, uh, the uh, liberal left is rather about, you know, there are fans of uh, uh, autonomy, um, strategic autonomy, which is uh, um, the notion, let me let me put it that way, to uh, to take uh, care for Europe uh, about the U European security by itself. Uh, I do believe that uh, we are stronger together, as mm -hmm. as uh, um, NATO says, right? stronger together, both uh, um, parts of the transatlantic alliance, the U.S., Canada, and the Europe uh, and the European Union. All those members and allies, they should be um, united. Of course, uh, for for Mr. Trump, but also I believe for uh, for Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris, the Chinese factor and the ch challenge which uh, uh, which is posted by by, by China is quite important and uh, and significant nevertheless first thing first first thing is to stop Russia uh, to deter Russia and to help uh, Ukraine to defend itself uh, and then we can think about other challenges which are um, quite far away but still very much important it's interesting that you say it because it remains without doubt here for us on the continent and in the European Union that stopping Russia is definitely a priority however uh, this leads me to my next uh, to my next and my final question that Donald Trump and his VP candidate J.D. Vance are veering towards the poli political isolationism and they made it quite clear that um, they might reconsider supporting Ukraine. How serious of a risk is that for Ukraine and Poland? This sort well, of an approach. You know, the, we we were we have been never fans of uh, of isolationists uh, uh, in the in the U.S. Uh, I agree with you that there are some sounds of this uh, of this uh, philosophy uh, when it comes to uh, JD Vance. That's why the number one task for us, for our government, but also for the opposition, to make a reach out to those guys, to JD Vance, and to uh, convince them how somehow how uh, why European defense is very much related also to the um, U. US uh, uh, security, why it's uh, kind of uh, uh, one job to be done for, for both of us, for Europe and for the um, US. Although I, um, I, I do believe and truly believe that J.D. Vance is not a, uh, an expert on foreign policy as for now. Maybe there is a room for, for us to convince him, to present him some facts and to, to get him on, on, on board on our, uh, on our side. But I, I do agree there are some worries, uh, uh, but that's what the diplomacy is all about, I mean, to convince other partners. The beautiful art of diplomacy. Thank you so much for joining me, Thank Marcin Przedaj, former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and the opposition member of the Polish Parliament. Thank you once again. Thank you for again. having me. Pleasure as always. And so this would be all the latest news for now here on World News Tonight. Please stay tuned for more news and features here on TVP World. Good night.